some great truths about himself and about God. And the one we're going to be looking at today, of course, is the one that Alan read to us earlier, Parable of the Servants, that's waiting for the Master to come home. I don't know about you, but some people struggle to wait. I don't know. Ha ha put your hand up if you enjoy waiting. Some people enjoy waiting, Marlene. <clears throat> um, you know, when I grew up, I went, uh, my parents dragged me along to church twice every Sunday for morning and in the evening. And when I was even younger, before I knew it, uh, for meetings Sunday afternoon as well. Uh, and I, I, I am really grateful, probably on two accounts, because it taught me about God, but also it taught me how to be bored. <laughs> and I had a lot of practice. And it's come in very useful. I never realised it was going to prepare me for my career path of being an accountant. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, uh, waiting is something that quite often we avoid. We don't actively seek it. And we see it more and more in today's society. We don't want to wait for anything like you know, complain that the, the web page took 15 seconds to load. I mean, what's going on here? Um, we see it in people don't want to wait to get married before they have sex. We see it in all sort of aspects of life that we don't like to wait. Uh, and we're talking, and Jesus is talking about, in some respects, waiting in this parable. And we all probably... Most of us could quote Psalm for, uh, Psalm, Isaiah 40, verse 31. You might know it off the top of your head, but once I start, you'll recognise it. But they that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And sometimes uh, when we have that concept of waiting as as a negative, you know, we don't particularly like waiting for the dentist. Uh, we'd rather just get in there if we're anything like me, uh, or, or rather just avoid it altogether. Uh, and we see it as a passive, passive activity, something where we do nothing. But waiting can be very rewarding. Waiting through those long, boring sermons I was able to play cricket with my mates out in the yard after the church had finished, but I had to do that waiting. If I hadn't waited, uh, then I wouldn't have received something good. So waiting can be something that is very good. And as we look at the passage today, if you look at, uh, at the first verse in 35, it says, we need to be stayed, dressed for action, and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. In other words, they need to be busy waiting for their master. And so we're going to look at three aspects of being ready, or waiting, being prepared is the first thing. Be dressed ready. Secondly, we're going to look at maintenance. It says that they need to keep their lamps burning. And thirdly, this morning, we're going to look at expectation and be like men waiting for the master. And, so, and, and then we might, if we have time, we might look at the second part of the passage, uh, which talks about who the story is for. And I'm going to try to do all that without mentioning the result on Friday night in the football. <laughs> but we'll see how we go. No promises there. <clears throat> so let's look at the first verse. Stay dressed for action. <clears throat> so we need to be dressed for action. For those that are listening to this online, I am uh, just put on a beanie with the uh, Sydney Roosters. I'm ready, I'm prepared, I'm dressed, ready for the game in two weeks. Of course, some of you 
can't be dressed prepared because you don't know who is playing in two weeks. <laughs> but for someone that follows the Sydney Roosters, we know. <laughs> so we need to be dressed ready for action. We need to be prepared. What does that involve? Is prepared, being prepared is just a one-off thing? Once I put the beanie on, I'm ready to go. That's all I have to do, sit back, relax. It says stay, in my version, actually says stay dressed for action. And now I think that's an important concept, that being prepared is not about just accepting Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. I'm ready, the Lord can come back, and I can just live however I want. But it's being staying dressed. We've all probably read <laughs> verses from Ephesians 6 verse 11 and as you consider being prepared and being clothed you, you might like to look up these verses and to remind yourself of some of the things or some of the ways that each of us can be prepared. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says put on the whole armour of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, God's grace, shoes of readiness given by the gospel of peace, shield of faith, in other words, belief in action, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, praying at all times in the spirit. Colossians 3 verse, uh, Colossians 3 verse 12, put, in, put on then or clothe yourself as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing one with one another. Then, then it goes on to tell us to forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven us. And then above all these, to put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So if you look at that passage, that can be a good passage to reflect on and start your preparation for your life and for living each day. Being prepared demands concentration. It demands us fixing our eyes on Jesus. I want, I'm going to do something now. I was talking to Alan a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about messages. I'm going to do something that I said I normally don't do, and that's give an illustration about myself. Being prepared is a bit like getting ready to pass an exam in some ways. How do we get ready for that? There's many different ways, and I remember uh, a question on the forum uh, at uni, and they asked the question, could anyone out there that gets higher marks give us the secret or the, the answer to how you get those higher marks instead of the average marks that I'm getting? And I wrote back a glib answer to start with, he said, what's the difference between getting average marks and really high marks? And I said, 60 hours of work. <laughs> and in reality, that's the truth, but it's only part of the truth. It is learning to be prepared. And that preparation doesn't happen, well, for me, it didn't happen a week before the exam or two days before the exam, but it happened right from the beginning. As soon as I got the materials, the preparation started. This message was, is a bit of an example because it was supposed to be last week, but Alan said with what we were discussing last week, I'm not sure whether we'll have time for the message, so you need to be prepared, but it might be next week. So that doesn't mean that I, uh, so I had to be prepared last, last week, but that doesn't, mean that my preparation stopped last Saturday night because the preparation continues because it's all about everything that we do is about being prepared and so you've got another 10 minutes this week because I've continued all day <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's important and, and if we get to the stage where we say well, all right I'm prepared then you're not prepared because the preparing needs to happen continually. It's, it's not a destination, it's a journey that we're on, that God's asked us to be on. It, it's like 
the servants waiting for their master, if they did all the preparations they, they did and, and then sat back and did nothing, they wouldn't have been prepared. The preparation does not cease. And that is true in our life. And it's the true when you're trying to study for an exam. And uh, as soon as I got the questions for the assignment, I would read them. Not, not, not that I'd start writing down in the thing, but because as I went through the material, as I listened to discussions on the forum, and, and in, as I lived out my life, I would be reflecting on the things that I needed to be prepared for. And if I didn't quite, quite understand them, then I would ask. So that as I reflected on them, I would gain understanding and start that preparation purpose. I think sometimes with uh, study, I, I know students probably wouldn't be really keen on this, but it's a pity that they, didn't, they don't follow Jesus' example. They tell you when the exam's going to be on. And humankind tend to leave things to the last minute. I've still got time to prepare. And, and so the preparation becomes late. And I think that's one reason why Jesus, uh, God more in, in a sense, uh, doesn't tell us the hour that he's coming back is because he wants us to be constantly preparing, no matter when that may be. And the good thing about preparing is sometimes we see preparation as just being about being ready. But that's not even the main purpose of being ready. The main purpose of being prepared through the subjects that I took at university was not to pass the exam, but was to, for me to learn and grow. And it's the same with our walk with Jesus Christ. The main purpose that why Jesus wants us to be prepared is not, it is because he wants us to be ready when he comes back, but it's because he wants us to learn and to live and to grow each day. And that's why it's a continuing process. And that leads us in some respects onto our second thing, which is um, to be uh, maintaining what, what God has put there, keeping our lamps burning. A good waiter is someone who maintains things. If we look at looking at a waiter as in someone that serves us at a restaurant, these same principles apply. So, you know, we might get the concept of a servant waiting for their master to come home from a wedding, but we do get the concept, I think, of a waiter at a restaurant. They need to prepare, they need to maintain things, make sure the salt and pepper, pepper Salt and pepper shakers are full, the, you know, the, the uh, cutlery is clean, ready to go. They need to maintain their environment. And of course, we'll look at in just a moment, they need to be expecting as to what, what is required. Maintenance. How do we keep your lamps burning? If we remember another parable, who remembers the parable of the ten virgins? that were waiting for the bride, uh, bridegroom. Um, <coughs> they had to have, like, keeping your lamps burning is not like just making sure the torch is on. They had to maintain it. They had to make sure they had oil uh, because the five of the virgins in that other parable that we're not looking at today, but uh, they ran out of oil. And so the lamps went out and they missed out. And so we need to maintain things, see? Uh, they didn't have street lights in those days. Uh, they didn't. Well, they weren't able to keep the porch light on, uh, so the master could easily find or enter uh, his door. You know, quite often, you know, if someone's coming to our place and they haven't been there before, and uh, uh, you want them, and it's night time, we'll say we'll, we'll put the porch light on so you know where we are. They didn't have that, so they needed. Uh, someone ready to help help him when he when the master returned. So the a, a good servant would be there 
listening for the sound of his master's return. Maybe it was a dog barking in the distance uh, so that he would have his light already lit, ready to go, so he could illuminate and thereby, thereby facilitate his master's way into the house. And so too with the disciple who wants, uh, who waits for the Lord's return. One's waiting should be spent making all preparations needed so that the Lord's return is not a surprise and so that we can be part of his return. How do we, in a practical sense then, keep our lamps filled with oil? How do we maintain things? Uh, last week, uh, for those that don't know, I moved office. And uh, so if you're looking for a good accountant, a farmer's accountant, give us a ring, uh, especially if you're in the farm. So we moved office and as part of that, we had some heavy desks and things and our new office is on that second story. So uh, we had to lift it upstairs and I discovered something that I hadn't maintained my physical uh, <laughs> ability. You see, I've been working for accountant for five and a half years and the strength had gone. I was prepared. I had the shoes, I had the right outfit, I, I was dressed ready for action. But because I'd let go of my maintenance when I needed it, I couldn't sustain it for any length of time. I had to keep stopping, having a breather, that sort of thing. We need to maintain it. And, and as well as being dressed for action. You know, being dressed for action, they understood what they meant because um, some version says, uh, have your loins girded. So in other words, they'd have their garments, they used to wear the flowing robes and stuff, pretty hard to work in. So what that sort of phrase meant was they, they tucked their, their garments in, into their belt, so to speak, so that they could be ready and they wouldn't get, uh, you know, tripped over or whatever, they'd be prepared for action. It's a bit like if in today's terminology, uh, we'd say, rolling up our sleeves, ready to go. And we need to maintain it. We need to be consistent. And it's a bit like my muscles, uh, faith is a bit like our muscles, you know, if we don't use it, we're gonna lose it. So the best way of maintaining things is to do, <laughs> do what God wants. The best thing for me, I never used to have to maintain physical fitness because I was so busy doing physical work that I naturally maintain. There's a new catchphrase that's going around a lot of Christian circles. Uh, as humans, we like fancy phrases and one of the, the newest ones, which is not a bad phrase, but it's spiritual discipline. And that's a little bit going along with the same theme of maintenance, a spiritual discipline. But I don't want you to get confused about what a spiritual discipline is. I've heard a lot of people talking about spiritual disciplines and they talk about the tools or the methods as spiritual disciplines. And so they say, well, journaling is a spiritual discipline. Journaling is a tool that helps us to ma maintain the spiritual discipline of connecting with God. And so I think if we, we start talking about spiritual breathing or, or journaling or reading the Bible or even quiet times as spiritual disciplines themselves, then we can confuse a lot of people. Because just because you don't journal doesn't mean that you're not spiritual, spiritually disciplined. It, it might just mean that that tool is something that doesn't work for you. So the things, spiritual disciplines that we need, uh, we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit daily. We need to let the Word of God dwell richly in our hearts. We need to serve. We need to praise God. We need to refresh ourselves. We need to communicate with God. They're, they are the spiritual disciplines. And a lot of these tools are 
very important for us in maintaining that. But don't get the two confused and, and because sometimes uh, people can beat themselves up over, I don't have a quiet time. Well, maybe you don't communicate to God in a quiet time. Maybe you communicate to God through loud music and, and, and verbalising things and painting pictures or going for a walk or whatever it may be. The main thing is we need to be maintaining our spiritual fitness. And that determines what is a spiritual discipline for each one of us. Is it maintaining my spiritual fitness? In other words, is it keeping me connected with God? Now, having said all that, um, I don't want you to get the idea is we have all these different tools and, and just disregard them without really contemplating how it applies for you. I want to give you an example, and that was when we were on um, the... What is it? Where have we got one of these? The conference thing at Churches of Christ. And one of the activities was that I decided to walk, and we're going to do this sort of spiritual walking thing. I don't know what they described it as, but we we're going to go. And we sat and we reflected and concentrated on something. That's what we had to do for a, for a moment and then consider what God was saying to us through that. And that's not sort of something that I usually do. And to be honest, I struggled with it for a start. And then I, God gave me the idea, well, you're not very good at drawing, because we had to draw a picture or something. I'm not, you're not very good at drawing. Um, maybe, you know, in high school you used to write poems. So I decided to write a poem. And through that, I now have over 60 poems in here. And God has given me the tool of writing bad poetry as a way of reconnecting in with God. And that's what you've got to do with maintenance. It's got to be something that works for you. But we've got to be careful as well that we just don't maintain one thing because we find that tool or that method or that thing appealing. So we really enjoy worship. That's all we're going to do. Bible reading, communicating with God. Uh, is It's a bit like me. Uh, maintaining the header at, on the farm that I used to have. There were some grease nipples that I just didn't like to get, but some were really easy and I sort of enjoyed doing that. But I certainly didn't enjoy the ones that were difficult to get at. And, it, and that's a bit like us, I think, when we just rely on the things that we enjoy doing and don't get a, a well-rounded maintenance. Sometimes you've got to get yourself out of the comfort zone. A bit like me going on that walk at that conference. Uh, so I thought I, 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 yesterday, I wrote a poem about writing poems. A poem about writing bad poetry. And, and because I couldn't uh, think of a title, I looked at the front of this book and it said Fresh Hope. So I've called the poem Fresh Hope. And, and it just describes how this helps me. Okay, so we'll see how this goes. The words written on these pages do not describe by half what's deep inside. They fail to express the pain of heartache. They come up short in describing amazing love. But what they do is start me thinking of the truth that can set me free. The words given by my Saviour speak of love and grace that is freely ours. They can enhance the joy that's lasting. They can give our lives true meaning, making sense of all our journeys, giving us purpose and fresh hope. And for me, that is the way that the words on these pages start me thinking and connecting in with God. Writing bad poetry for you might be too hard because it's... Uh, you can just write good poetry and, and and you could never do it. But for me, it's something that's coming more and more naturally. 
um, each day. <laughs> Find out what works and be diligent about it and be well-rounded in your uh, maintenance. And the third thing we're going to look at is expectation. Be like men waiting for their master. They were ready. They were expecting him at any moment. Uh, it's a bit like slip fielders. The key for slip fielders in cricket. I think Aunt Doc would probably know where I'm heading with this. One of the things as a slip fielder is that you have to expect the ball every time to come your way. And in fact, you could use the same thing for, for all three of them. You need to prepare, you need to maintain, practice, 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 and you need to be expecting. And it's the same with us. So what do we expect? Are we to be expectant that God's going to do everything for us? That life is going to be easy? What does it mean to be expecting, expectant of Jesus and God? It doesn't mean that. It means we expect God to be there for us no matter what. We expect God to help us through the hard times. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. He also said, do not fear because I have overcome the world. So we need to be expecting God to be there for us. We need to be expecting God to be using us. We need to be expecting God to accept us. We should be expecting God to keep his promises and to help us with his strength each day. So those are the three things that as we wait on the Lord, we should be doing. Preparation, maintenance, and expecting him at any moment, and expecting him to work in our lives. The second part of the parable, Peter asked the question, well, who, who was this um, parable for? And if you read it, Jesus didn't really answer him. He just told him another story. And I think it was because, and, and there, was a lot, there was a lot of discussion about what Jesus meant in the second part of this reading, uh, that it, you know this, this is talking about uh, the Jews or the Pharisees, and he's talking about the Gentiles, etc., etc. I think God was saying this parable is for everyone and you need to work out where you are in this story. And he didn't want to give a final answer, a bit like not wanting um, to give us a, a, a date when he's gonna return because he wants us to be preparing, he wants us to be reflecting he, at, at all times. And so he told that story about three, three servants. You have the a faithful one that's doing the right thing. You have a, an abusive one. And, and you have one uh, that's doing the wrong thing but doesn't know that they're doing the wrong thing. And you're probably in there somewhere. And then he, final, he finalises the story by saying, to, uh, to some much has been given and much will be demanded. And sometimes that can seem overwhelming. But what do you think he was meaning to them when he said much has been given? To the Jews that were hearing it at that time. What was the much he was talking about? Perhaps the law? Perhaps the knowledge of God? What is the much, as, as Alan has said, these parables have a message for them today, but also a message that God has for us today. What is the much that has been given to us? Any? Jesus, yes. The Sunday school answer is correct on this occasion. Jesus, that's what he's given us. And sometimes we think, well, much has been demanded. But may I say, I read this online and I thought it was a, an apt finish. The much that has been demanded is the same as the much that has been given. Think about that, what, how that applies to us. The much is Jesus. He's been given to us. The much that is demanded is Jesus. 
That's what we need to give. That's what we need to be ready with. That's what we need to maintain things for is Jesus and his grace, his forgiveness, his strength. It's not, I'm giving you a whole heap and you've got to come up with something that somehow returns the favour. He's giving us a whole heap so that we can give out of what he's given. And that is how we are going to be prepared. That is how we're going to maintain our spiritual lives. And that is how we're going to be expectant of our God uh, who will do great things through every one of us seated here today and even the one standing up.